What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of news to go over this week, but first we have several different Toyota Supra stories here. Uh, first off is it's been officially teased by Toyota. Um, this is very exciting. We knew that there was going to be an official reveal at the Geneva Motor Show, but it might not be as full of a reveal as we were hoping. So uh, first off, let's talk about this teaser. You can see the double bubble roof that we've seen in all the spy photos. Um, same with the trunk lid. It looks all very similar to the spy shots. But that spoiler is huge, and that's actually disappointing. The reason being is, according to the statement they put out with this teaser, Toyota said they're showing a modern racing concept and that it signals Toyota's commitment to bring back uh, to market its most iconic sports car. Which is good news because that means they're def that they're bringing the Super name back. You know, there, was a, there was some debate in the past about whether this would actually be called a Supra or not, and this statement makes it sound like it is definitely going to be called the Supra, but it's going to be a racing concept version of the Supra, not the normal production streetcar version. Um, so that's a little bit unfortunate. Um, now some other news here is actually Best Car Magazine in Japan. They leaked some Id some images that uh, Mark V uh, Super Forums posted up here uh, that look computer generated but um, you can see that racing one looks exactly like what we're looking at um, in you know the teaser image the Toyota put out and the fact that this is in a print publication means they must have had some forewarning and some you know info about this before Toyota released this statement because you can't print a magazine you know less than 24 hours after Toyota posted this teaser so this isn't some speculative thing I think this is a accurate you know, rendering of what it is going to look like that we're going to see at Geneva. They also posted some normal production car, uh, you know, renderings there as well, based off of that racing concept. Um, I am assuming so. I don't think those don't look like they're officially from Toyota. It's possible that they are. Maybe Toyota will show, um, you know, the actual production version as well. But it's sounding like from other reports here that um, we're not going to see the actual production streetcar version of the Supra until 2019 which is even more waiting um, because I believe that it was the Detroit Motor Show in 2014 is when we originally saw the uh, FT1 concept, which was the basis for this new Super. So if that's the case, it'll be a full five years since that concept for the production version to come out. Uh, production uh, cycles and development uh, schedules here for Japanese cars just kills me. It takes them forever to come out with stuff. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm just glad it's being developed at all. Um, some other stuff though here. Um, there's a user on the Bimmer Post forums, you know, the large BMW forum, um, and this person has a history of providing uh, info and scoops in the past. Um, anyway, so they were digging around in the BMW files, you know, since this is being co-developed, this Supra with the new Z4, um, and uh, he was on here as stating uh, that uh, it will be a Toyota in name and body design only. Same options, same colors, same interior materials as the Z4, um, which is what we were seeing with the spy photos. It looked like a BMW interior, um, and this lines up with that. I don't know where they're getting their information from, but they supposedly are, you can get some kind of source telling them all these types of things. Um, and then the engines have also been a thing that's been a conflicting report in the past, with auto car saying there's going to be like four different tunes for a six-cylinder engine, but then there were other uh, there was a leaked BMW document last year that said that there's going to be a couple four-cylinder options and six-cylinder, which makes sense considering BMW likes doing that with all their models. You have a four-cylinder one, you have a six-cylinder one, um, and since this is sharing everything with the Z4 most likely, um, that is uh, sounding more and more likely, and this person is claiming there will be two different turbocharged four-cylinder engines in the Supra for the global Supra. Here in America, we'll only get one of those turbocharged four-cylinder engines, um, and then that'll be the base model, and then there'll be the upper trim six-cylinder model. And in regards to the details on that six-cylinder model, the top one for the Super would be 335 horsepower, um, and uh, so you know, it'd be based kind of, I think, loosely on the current uh, six-cylinder single-turbo, uh, you know, models you have from BMW. 335 horsepower. Now, the kicker is, although it's sharing all this stuff with the Z4 and it's like, oh, it's going to have all the same stuff as the Z4, the two good things the Z4 is going to have, apparently the Supra, according to this guy, won't get. Those two good things are that in the Z4, you'll be able to get a 380 horsepower version, um, and that's going to keep, I guess with maybe BMW and Toyota's agreement, BMW agreed to have the top one and be the top dog, um, you know, both in pricing and in performance, I suppose, uh, although the Z4 is going to 
going to be exclusively convertible. Um, but anyway, so BMW is only getting the 380 horsepower version. And you're going to be able to get a manual, at least in some form, on the Z4. Supra will be automatic only, which is something that I've mentioned in previous updates in the past. This has been a rumor for a while now. Sounds all but confirmed now, which I'm sure is going to upset a lot of people. But to uh, look at the glass half full here, this, the auto, automatic transmission they're saying is going to be an 8-speed. And since it's sourced from BMW, that means it's most likely sourced from ZF. If it's the glorious 8-speed uh, ZF automatic, it's one of the best automatics out there. I loved it and everything that I've reviewed with it. Um, it's very fast, nearly dual-clutch fast. I don't think it's going to be too bad if that's the only transmission available for it. Um, and still will be a very sporty offering, um, but they're saying it's going to be a normal torque converter automatic, no kind of dual clutch or anything like that. Um, so that's basically all the newest news on the Supra. Now, the Geneva Motor Show is uh, March 6th, so we're only, you know, three weeks away from, you know, all the official info, at least on this racing version. Who knows? Maybe, you know, it'll be another year before we actually get all this officially confirmed by Toyota. I don't know. But a lot of people are really upset and they're saying, you know, the Supra is sounding less and less desirable the more they hear about it. If it's just a hard top BMW Z4, essentially, um, it, it does kind of, you know, make it not that great as far as the Supra naming goes. But I think the Supra name, as happy as I am, the Supra name is coming back. I think it's going to kind of screw this car over in a way um, because, you know, everyone's thinking super, super. So they, they want, you know, these high horsepower motors. They want it to be the similar dimensions and stuff. But if you think about it, this, sup this new Super is going to be smaller in every way than even the Mark IV Supra, which, you know, most cars since the 90s have gotten much bigger. This is actually going smaller. So really, it's only going to be a Super in name only. I would really more so look at this car not as a Supra, but look at it as the Turbo FRS, Turbo Toyota 86 that Subaru refused to make with Toyota. And instead, Toyota went and worked with BMW to make the faster 86. And that's what this, that's how, kind of how I'm looking at this. And when you look at it like that, think of it as basically, you know, a slightly heavier, but 335 horsepower version of the BRZ. That sounds great. That sounds awesome. It's a small little platform. And I think, you know, Toyota, maybe that's what was going on behind the scenes. Subaru's like, nope, we want to preserve our pecking order with the WRX and WRX STI. BRZ cannot have any more than 205 horsepower. And so Toyota said, okay, fine, we'll go to BMW and we'll make our 300 plus horsepower version with them instead. And it worked out because BMW wanted to, you know, you know, lower costs on the Z4. And that could be very well what happened. I'm just speculating here, but if you look at it like that, I'm I'm still very excited for the Supra. Yes, it would be nice if it had a manual option. We'll have to wait and see. They may add that in later on or something, especially if the framework is there with the Z4. That means it's possible, you know, so maybe if there's enough demand, we'll have to see. Anyway, don't want to go on too much longer about that because there's lots of other stuff to cover, but just thought that was very interesting to note there. Uh, lots of teasers here for the Geneva Motor Show uh, coming out. Ferrari has officially teased the 48 Special Series is what they're referring to it as currently. Previous names were 48 GTO, um, you know, some type of speciality version of the 48. Anyway, it's just a bunch of quick close-ups and really far away shots. So you can't really make out too many details. The best shot we have is a blurry shot of the front end. Um, now, we've already seen this car thanks to a leaked image at some kind of private event. Um, and it looks like that matches up with this teaser. So most likely that leaked image is, uh, you know, what it will end up being. And again, we will at least see that officially all revealed here on March 6th. Another teaser that we're not sure is Geneva because there's some reports saying it'd be later in the year. But anyway, it's the Rolls-Royce Cullinan. Rolls-Royce uh, put out a teaser and posted the Cullinan name. They confirmed it will be called the Cullinan. This is their SUV version of the Phantom. And um, so, yeah, the fact they're teasing it right before Geneva makes me think it is going to be a Geneva reveal. But there's other publications that are still insisting it's going to be debuting later this summer. So, I'm not sure, but I would bank on Geneva. I think that's a safe possibility for that. Another vehicle, uh, going back to uh, some Subaru stuff here. Subaru has uh, teased the Visive Tourer concept they'll be showing at Geneva. Um, and so this is likely going to have similar styling to the Visive Performance concept. Uh, basically, um, this is what they did in the past where they show a wagon version of the WRX, which is called the Lavorg in the rest of the world. But we don't get it here for some strange reason, even though so many people are begging and pleading 
for a you know return of the WRX wagon. Subaru will not bring it for reasons beyond my understanding. Um, and so anyway, that's most likely what this is. So although it's going to be gorgeous looking, one, it's just a Subaru concept, which means it will not make it to production anything close to looking like that. And also we probably won't even get it here in the States, uh, not to be a Debbie Downer, but so that's most likely what's going on with this Lavorg uh, tour. Uh, who knows? Maybe we will get some type of wagon WRX for the next gen version. Um, but I think if anything, it's more likely we will get a Cross Trek XT or something like that instead, since that's you know the same uh, bones. They can just throw the WRX motor in the Cross Trek and continue on with their performance SUV lineup that you know only is currently consisting of the Forester XT. We'll have to wait and see. But anyway, um, interesting to at least see that little teaser, and we'll see more images here in a couple of weeks. Mercedes has lots of stuff they're debuting at the Geneva Motor Show, so much so that they actually uh, teased one, but then officially revealed three of the others ahead of the show. So first, Mercedes has teased the AMG GT four-door. Now, we don't have an official name for that just yet still, but they're showing the production version in Geneva here, and they just showed some teaser images of it camouflaged, uh, doing some wind tunnel testing there. Um, so cool to see that. You know, we'll have to wait and see all the official details around the reveal. Um, but it just seems like all there's just getting more and more redundant with the uh, model line of Mercedes. Uh, but anyway, I'm excited to see it nonetheless. But I guess they didn't want to take the limelight away from the uh, AMG GT four-door because they revealed the other three debuts they're going to have at Geneva already ahead of the show. The first is uh, the 2019 Mercedes AMG G63. And so as you can see, it's just the AMG version of the G-Wagon we just saw debut uh, last month. And so um, you can see it's got the more aggressive front bumper there. It's got that new Pan America AMG grill. They're calling it with the slats. It's going to be running the 4-liter twin-turbo V8 engine that does 577 horsepower, 621 pound-feet of torque here in the G63, 9-speed automatic, and all-wheel drive are standard, of course. 4.4 seconds 0 to 60 for the G-Wagon now, which is uh, almost a full second quicker than the old G63. It's 0.9 seconds faster, uh, so really a huge leap forward there. 137 mile per hour top speed, uh, but if you get the driver's package, that's uh, raised to 149 miles per hour for the uh, limiter there, um, which is plenty fast for a huge rolling toaster oven. Um, so anyway, that's pretty impressive there. And now, you know, all the new G-Wagons have this new independent front suspension, so they'll actually handle half decent and not drive like a car from the uh, 80s. And so that's uh, going to be a good improvement that I'm sure AMG is going to further utilize, um, you know, with their enhancements. It's, uh, all the AMG versions here are going to have adaptive dampers and all that type of stuff as well to help it handle better. So anyway, cool to see that. The other Mercedes uh, reveal here, uh, they're going to be, they just already showed the 2019 Mercedes Maybach S-Class. Uh, and so you can see the uh, more unique looks. Now they already have the Maybach version of the S-Class. This is just a refresh, you know, like a light change um, where you get the vertical, vertical slats and the grills there, which... To me, that looks like exactly like a BMW grill. I don't know why. That's BMW's thing is vertical slats. Like, do anything other than that, Mercedes. I don't know why they're going to that, but they are. Um, there's also two, new two-tone paint options, which is pretty cool and harkens back to the you know previous gen Mybox uh, and you know obviously to old school uh, Mybox as well. And I think that looks really good there with the two-tone combo. There's uh, of course new wheels. There's new interior colors um, and options inside. Otherwise, though, it's the same as the 2018 model. You get the same uh, option of a V8 or a V12, depending on how much you want to pay. Um, and anyway, they're going to be on sale this summer in the United States. Um, the last reveal they have here is the 2019 C-Class refresh. So a, they only posted a few pictures of it, but uh, what we can see here, new headlights and taillights that have you know some new design elements in them. Tweaks to the bumpers, although that's hard to tell because all we're seeing here is what looks like the C43 version, you know, the uh, AMG version there. Um, inside, though, there's some nice improvements. It's got digital gauges that are optional, you can see there. New widescreen displays you can get either in a 7-inch or a 10.25-inch uh, setup there. Um, but the big news is all the driver assistance stuff. So they're throwing all the autonomous tech from the E-Class into the C-Class here, making it available in a, a more advanced uh, driver assistance package. So that gives you active driving assist, blind spot assist, steering assist, lane keeping assist, and lane changing assist. So essentially it'll pr pretty much drive itself on the highway 
and I think you know do a lot of other additional things as well here with all that tech. Other uh, mechanical things, the C300 gets a little bit of a horsepower bump, 14 more horsepower here for 2019 for a total of 255 horsepower and 273 pound-feet of torque. Same 9-speed automatic that the current C-Class has, and uh, you know you can get all-wheel drive there on them as well. But anyway, cool to see all that. And a few cars this week got pricing announced for them. The first is the Alfa Romeo Stelvio Quadrifolio, which uh, is officially going to be about $6,000 more than the Giulia Quadrifolio. Um, so the Stelvio starts at eighty-one thousand five hundred ninety dollars, um, and that's you get an you can get an option for like carbon fiber bucket Sparco seats and carbon ceramic brakes, which actually could push that up close to hundred grand, I think. Um, but you know, still you're getting what is now currently the fastest SUV around the Nurburgring uh, for those who care. But it's still really impressive. Three point nine seconds zero to sixty. Uh, if you're a fan of the Grand Tour. You'll see that Jeremy Clarkson uh, drove one in this past week's episode, and uh, you know was very very cool i i really love it so um yeah a little bit more expensive than the julia and of course uh like clarkson says he'd rather have the julia i'd rather have the julia as well but if you need an suv Stelvio quadrifolio is one of the coolest suvs out there i think so anyway um cool to see that priced another suv that was priced was the uh, 2019 subaru ascent um so they uh, announced it's going to be starting at thirty two thousand nine hundred and seventy dollars and that's with standard eight passenger seating tri-zone climate control eyesight tech and a six and a half inch uh infotainment screen with apple carplay and android auto all standard which is pretty good standard equipment although there are a few uh notable exceptions that uh kind of force you into those nicer models if you want some basic things for example if you want the premium model that's going to be an extra you know uh 2500 bucks or so thirty five thousand one hundred and seventy dollars um and that's uh the only way you can get a leather wrapped steering wheel so the base one you don't even get a leather wrapped steering wheel like yeah come on for over thirty thousand dollars just throw it in anyway um so that's uh and that's also how you get heated seats is with the premium trim the next step up is the limited trim it's roughly 40 grand thirty nine thousand nine hundred and seventy dollars that adds the proximity key and push button start. Now I think there's a package that can be added to the premium so you can get that because otherwise that's crazy. You gotta spend 40 grand on one of these things in order to not dig the key out of your pocket to unlock it. Um, especially for people loading in eight passengers if they're all kids. The last thing you wanna do is be worrying about fumbling with a key. So that's again, something that is standard on most vehicles these days. So I'm surprised they're making people pay extra for that. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, there's the uh, touring trim is the top trim. That's gonna be $45,670. That adds a heated steering wheel, Java brown leather, wood trim, ventilated front seats, a rear view camera mirror, uh, and then there's a few other things as well. I think it's a front camera camera and things like that. Again, I hope you'll be able to add a heated steering wheel onto the lower models because again, if you have to spend 45 grand in order to get a heated steering wheel in one of these things in a zone where most people are going to be buying these is, you know, where it's cold during the winter, you would think they would throw in a heated steering wheel. Again, that's like a $250 option, even on like a Mercedes. Why do you have to step up to a 45 grand version, fully loaded version in order to get a heated steering wheel? So hopefully, like I said, some of this stuff is broken into options. Otherwise, the packaging um, isn't that great for the ascent in my opinion but um you still do get a lot for that standard uh, 32 grand price or 33 roughly um so anyway interesting to see that a few BMW stories this past week. The first is another pricing story. The BMW i8 Roadster was officially priced, um, and it's also a rough uh, price. So it's going to be starting at $163,300, which is about $20,000 more than the coupe version of the i8. So uh, is a retractable folding, you know, top uh, something that's worth an extra twenty grand, maybe to some people. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, the pricing there on that, and that's before options, of course, which with BMWs can get real expensive real quick. For example, there's laser light headlights, which are very cool, but cost $6,300. Um, anyway, these uh, i8 Roadsters are going to be available in March, so right around the corner here. Um, another uh, BMW that was actually officially revealed this past week ahead of the Geneva Motor Show is the 2019 X4. Um, and so, again, I think they're revealing this ahead of time because they would don't want to steal the limelight away from the Z4, which I believe is going to be revealed at Geneva alongside that Super. We'll have to see. Um, but anyway, so this new X4, completely next-gen version, you know, of the X4 here, the second generation. Um, it's going to be 3.2 inches longer than the old X4, 2.1 inches longer in the wheelbase, uh, which helps with rear seat room and things like that, and it's 1.5 inches wider as well. 
Now, they only revealed the European version to us here, so we have all the European engine options, which are like, you know, a dozen options. That's an exaggeration, but there's, I think, six or seven options here. Um, but as far as the Europeans go, they're going to be starting off with an xDrive 20i version that has a 2-liter turbo and 181 horsepower. Historically, we don't get that low of a horsepower figure for the X4 here. Uh, but anyway, the top version is the M40i, which has the uh, N55 inline uh, 6 motor from the BMW M2. Uh, um, and so it's going to be probably around that same 355 horsepower, 369 pound-feet of torque here. That's what they're announcing for Europe. You know, I'm sure it'll be similar for the States. 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds for that ver version there. And uh, there's going to be multiple diesel options for Europe. We probably won't get any of them here in the States, uh, given the current uh, diesel reception uh, over the past couple of years. And um, But anyway, the, for you Europeans, there's actually going to be a cool M40i diesel or M40d uh, diesel version. And that's going to be almost as fast is the gasoline version. It's only 0.1 seconds slower, 0 to 60. Um, it's a very impressive performance and it's way better as far as the emissions and consumption goes on the diesel M40 version. And so uh, cool for those in Europe at least. And um, here in America, our base motor is most likely going to be the 28 version, um, which uses that same 2 liter turbo four cylinder, but it does 240 horsepower. Um, all the models are going to be all wheel drive, though. That's one thing that's uh, notable. So, you know, some of the other competitors have front wheel drive or rear wheel drive versions. This, it's all all wheel drive. They all use an eight speed automatic. Um, and uh, they're even uh, offering as an option the 2.2 inch uh, touchscreen key fob from the uh, 7 series. Um, and that allows you to do the basic key functions plus adjust the climate control and opening or closing the windows. I'm not sure how much that option costs, but I'm sure it's far too much for just doing those two uh, things on it. I don't, again, I don't know why BMW is even bothering with that. It's really laggy and slow from what I've seen. Just use the uh, smartphone app instead. But Anyway, I digress. CarPlay and now Android Auto are both going to be available as well. But to go uh, to avoid another mini rant, you might remember a few weeks ago I mentioned how BMW is planning on making CarPlay a subscription service instead, making you pay yearly for it instead of just having it as a flat fee. Um, but anyway, uh, it's going to be you know offered there. But Android Auto is a cool addition because for a while there, BMW was only doing CarPlay, so cool to see the Android guys included as well. And anyway, the X4 is going to be arriving in the United States in. October. So cool to see that. Also, uh, Bimmer Post has some new info on the uh, M2 competition model that uh, we've been hearing about that's going to be coming here. And so according to their info on the Bimmer Post uh, forum post here, it's going to be revealed at the Beijing Motor Show in April. Um, and supposedly, according to the documents or whatever they found, it's going to make 405 horsepower, which is 40 more than a regular M2. But it's actually going to replace the M2s. They're, they won't be sold alongside each other. This is going to replace the regular M2, and you'll only be able to get the competition version, which would be unfortunate if that's true because I'm sure it'll be more expensive, which makes it less appealing. And competition means it most likely will have a stiffer suspension, which not everyone wants. I really enjoyed the standard M2, and it'd be a shame if they already were getting rid of it. But, uh, you know, it seems like these small baby M's are often, you know, uh, not a lasting thing. Um, and so, anyway, we'll have to see if that turns out to be true. But anyway, the other improvements here to get that additional horsepower for the competition model, they're going to be switching from the single turbo N55 motor to the detuned uh, M3 slash M4 motor with its twin turbo S55 uh, uh, setup is what it's internally called at BMW there. And anyway, supposedly production for these is starting in July and they won't be limited in their production as far as, you know, BMW is not going to be like, oh, we're only making X amount. Instead, they're going to say, they're just saying they're building as many as people will order, um, which I think is the better way to do things. So that way you avoid dealer markup. You know, you can just be like, well, I'll just order one. Like if you're going to charge me a markup. Um, and so it sounds like, you know, this artificial limitation, I think the, comp the manufacturers are figuring out that if you do some type of limitation, then everyone marks up the price and it goes through the roof. Whereas if you just say, we'll just build however many, no one has any clue how many are going to end up being built and how many are going to be ordered. So it's a lot harder to do that. And I think that's actually what Ford's doing with the bullet production. They're not, they're saying it's limited edition, but they're not saying it's limited production. They're saying, they told me personally, they're going to build as many as people order. And you know, that's going to be kind of open-ended that way. Again, you can't have dealers saying, oh, we're only making a thousand of these or whatever it is. Instead, they're going to be like, it's whatever. And so dealers uh, won't feel as much of an urge to charge a markup, I suppose. But I'm sure some will certainly try. 
Anyway, other stuff getting back to the M2 competition here. Um, it's also going to be offered in a new silver Hockenheim col color and also sunset orange, which is cool to see. And the last BMW story here is uh, Auto Cars reporting that the production version of the X7 three-row SUV there is going to be revealed at the LA Auto Show in November. Um, but then they're also saying it's going to be on sale only a month later. They're saying before the end of the year is when it'll be on sale. So you're revealing at the end of November and then it's going to be on sale like a few weeks later. I I have a hard time believing that so either the reveal is going to be earlier than the LA Auto Show or the uh, you know actual on sale date for these is going to be uh, next year instead of the end of this year. Either way though it sounds like that's their general idea of when it's coming is LA Auto Show which gives us a good idea and certainly makes sense with all these other reveals BMW has earlier this year. Um, so anyway uh, interesting to hear that. Uh, Porsche was spied testing the Cayman GT4 basically completely on camouflage. They do very little camo these days and uh, it makes sense because it's hard to hide, you know, the Cayman GT4. It's got some very large obvious giveaways like that huge spoiler and it looks like all that stuff they're going to retain from the previous gen GT4. Very similar in its, you know, elements, uh, you know, with a similar front bumper, similar rear spoiler, just, you know, has the new headlights and taillights from the updated, you know, 718 Cayman and um, yeah, so uh, it's most likely also still going to continue using the flat six at least and maybe this one last time also because it's been confirmed most likely that the boxster spider is also going to use that uh, flat six for its last time again before that all goes completely turbo i think for the next gen version um and will be a cool you know last hurrah here for the flat six since the cayman and boxster with the 718 version haven't had a flat six version um, but anyway that's likely to be re re revealed at geneva but we don't have any official teasers from porsche so we don't know for sure just yet but anyway interesting to see that Nissan has officially announced that they're going to be bringing the next gen 2019 Nissan Altima to the New York Auto Show, which is the end of March here. Um, and so that's when we'll be seeing that. We've already seen some spy shots, so we have a pretty good idea of what it's going to look like. Maximum inspired styling there in the front. Um, and overall, you know, it should be a pretty good look, but we'll have to wait till then for all the details on that. Uh, a competitor to the uh, Altima here, uh, actually at the Chicago Auto Show, Volkswagen, uh, their North American CEO was sitting down with some journalists and talking about their future product plans um, and said that the next gen Passat is going to be coming next year uh, and that it's also going to be arriving alongside a new Atlas sized crossover that's also coming in 2019, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. I know it's probably easy for them to make some koopy version of the Atlas and, you know, just uh, say, hey, everyone loves huge SUVs, let's do that. But they're completely neglecting the small crossover market. They have the Tiguan, which used to be the small one, which is now huge. And you have the Atlas, which is like double XL sized. I mean, it's a massive SUV. Um, and so to do another huge, massive SUV, why not do something small? Because currently the only small SUV they offer is the Tiguan Limited, which is uh, basically the old Tiguan. They, they just continue to build. And it's kind of embarrassing how outdated the uh, Tiguan Limited is. Um, and so, yeah, I just, no, I don't know why they're neglecting the compact crossover market because it's a very hot segment. And for them to be focusing on huge, massive SUVs, seems a little interesting. But again, uh, anyway, interesting to uh, hear all that. Maserati was spy testing the Levante GTS once again, this time in the snow. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we've been seeing this a couple of times. We should be seeing it sometime this year in its production form. We know it's going to have uh, the same motor as the Quattroporte GTS, most likely with its, you know, Ferrari design 3.8 liter V8 that does 570 horsepower, 515 pound-feet of torque. Um, and so, yeah, that can't come soon enough. I think it's, uh, you know, going to be pretty sweet. Another vehicle that'll be pretty sweet that was spy testing was the uh, Bentley Flying Spur. It was also spy testing in the snow here. Um, and looks, I mean, it's got the same kind of camo as the Continental GT did before it made its reveal. So, you know, usually historically the Flying Spur is just a four-door version of the Continental GT, most likely in its styling. I would expect that for this new version as well. I mean, it'll probably be a little more unique in some ways, but expect basically a four-door Continental GT. And I think you have a, pretty much the right idea there. Anyway, we should be seeing that sometime before the end of this year or very early next year. But anyway, interesting to see that running around. 
And some unfortunate news here. Uh, Ford has announced that uh, Focus RS production is in fact ending on April 6th. Um, I know some people that was news. It kind of fell through the cracks that you know, they were. this was a limited thing and they weren't going to build a ton of them. Um, but it's actually official. April 6th is when the Focus RS will end production. They're ending it with a 50 model run for the UK only. They're right-hand drive only heritage editions, they're calling them. Um, and they're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Escort with these. Uh, and so they're going to be coming... Uh, with a dealer fitted Ford Performance uh, Mount Tune 375 upgrade, which uh, adds a high flow induction kit, upgraded recirculating valve, and a new tune, which gives it uh, four, uh, 370 horsepower and 376 pound feet of torque. So, you know, an extra 20 uh, horsepower there, which is cool. Uh, they're only, only going to be available in this teeth orange color, and uh, they're going to have the black accents you see there for the spoiler and wheels. Um, they're going to be priced at 39,895 pounds there in the UK, which is about 3,600 pounds more than the uh regular focus rs but of course that's before again dealer markup if you're only, they're only building 50 of these can you imagine the markup on these um so i'm sure in reality they'll go for much more than that um and sad to see the focus rs ending but there's already rumors that a next gen focus rs is already in development we actually other um some other focus news here this past week is that some random person um, in Portugal, I think, happened to be uh, happened to walk onto a photo shoot for the Next Gen Global Focus and snapped one picture before uh, the Ford employees chased them away. Um, and anyway, what we see from that one picture now, we've already seen the camouflage pictures of the Focus, so this isn't a huge revelation anyway. But we do get to see, you know, how it looks without any kind of crazy camo wrap on it. It looks really good. It's got some Volvo-inspired headlights there. It looks a little more upscale. It looks really, really good. Um, and anyway, so this picture was posted in uh, Vezes uh, Magazine, I think is how you pronounce that. Anyway, we know the global focus reveal is going to be at a standalone event in April. Um, now, as far as the U.S. version, it's always lagging behind, and it's still kind of unclear if, like, how we're getting the new focus and, you know, how the U.S. version is going to be different, because we know that Ford has said they're not bringing any Chinese-built focuses to the United States. Uh, same with the Fusion, and so currently the focus, these next-gen focus, will be built in either Germany for the European ones or China for, you know, the Asia market uh, versions. So um, they're gonna have to figure out some way to you know build some that you know can come here to the United States. So that whole thing's really unclear still as far as how we're going to get this focus or when it's coming. But supposedly they're developing an RS version and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so, but anyway, interesting to at least see that one picture. Um, Auto Week this past week is reporting that Subaru is planning to release an all-wheel drive plug-in hybrid version of one of their existing models before the end of this year. Um, and so, supposedly, you know, since uh, Toyota owns part of Subaru, um, basically they would be borrowing uh, the electrical tech from the Prius Prime and uh, putting that into an existing uh, Subaru model. And uh, according to the report, it's going to still keep its boxer engine, which I think uh, goes without saying. Subaru wouldn't give that up. It's just the electrical components that are coming from the Prius there. Um, and anyway, so it's going to be supposedly on a Subaru that's built in Japan, um, I guess, to help with production or whatever. And so that would leave it at either being the Crosstrek or the Forester are going to be you know, one of those two vehicles is going to get this plug in hybrid variant. Now, it could go either way. The 2019 Forester should be re happening relatively soon as revealed. It's an all new next gen version of the Forester. Um, could be showing up as soon as the New York, new York Auto Show here um, in April, you know, which I think somewhat likely. And uh, so it could be a, you know, plug-in hybrid version of that that's going to be debuting at the LA Auto Show. Uh, you know, later on this year, or they could go back and do another Crosstrek uh, plug-in hybrid. You know, they did the regular hybrid version of the Crosstrek, wasn't a plug-in, but they actually discontinued that last year due to slow sales and also because that generation Crosstrek was coming to an end. So they could be trying again with the improved version of the Crosstrek hybrid here on the new next-gen version. So it could go either way. It could be both of them eventually, I'm sure. We know Subaru has a full EV coming in 2021. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we should be seeing that, I'm guessing, the LA Auto Show uh, in November for the plug-in hybrid. And speaking of electrical stuff, the last story this week is uh, some uh, updates here on Dyson's electric vehicle plan. So, you know, the vacuum cleaner uh, maker Dyson, they're, uh, you know, they announced last year they're going to be building a car, but now we have more details and they're actually going to be uh, revealing, uh, the first one's going to be showing up in 20. 
2020, but it's going to be a Halo model, and then there will be two other models to follow, uh, according to their plans here. This is by the Financial Times that's reporting this. Um, so, uh, the first Halo model is going to be using a lithium-ion batteries, which originally they said that all their all their cars are going to be solid-state batteries. Now they're saying the Halo one's going to be lithium-ion, but then the, the cheaper two uh, lesser, you know, more mundane vehicles, those will have the solid-state batteries, and those will come later, sometime after 2020. Um, but that Halo model, it's probably going to be some type of performance or luxury vehicle. That's going to be made in less than 10,000 units, they said. So somewhat limited production, although that's still an awful lot for a company that uh, who knows if they'll even be able to sell that many. Um, but yeah, so anyway, you know, we know Fisker already has a solid state battery thing. They're trying to push out here pretty quickly. Uh, and everyone's trying to become Tesla. Everyone wants to be Tesla. So we'll have to see if Dyson has any better luck than Fisker has. And uh, anyway, interesting to hear that but that's it for all the news this week guys let me know all your thoughts about everything in the comments below thank you guys very much for watching and i'll see you next time take care